invite you to join me in the book of Hebrews, chapter 2, this morning. Hebrews, chapter 2. I've always wondered what it would have been like to have had an older brother. I never had one. I always was the older brother. And frankly, I'm a little afraid to ask my sister to tell me what it was like to have an older brother. But I always thought it would have been nice to have had someone that uh, would have stuck up for me in the neighborhood. Um, someone that always made sure I got picked for the team. And um, you know, somebody maybe that went through high school before me and made a good impression, made it easier on me. Good older brother is sort of like a trailblazer, a pioneer, if you will. And if you're a Christian today, you have one, spiritually speaking. I want us to look this morning at uh, Hebrews chapter 2, verses 10 through 13 together that reflects on this. Notice what the writer expresses here. For it was fitting that he, for whom and by whom all things exist, in bringing many sons to glory, should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. For he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one source. That is why he is not ashamed to call them brothers, saying, I will tell of your name to my brothers in the midst of the congregation, I will sing your praise. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children God has given to me. I saw a story one time about a poor man who lived on Skid Row. He lived there with other men who had similar problems and uh, this particular man despite his condition always insisted to his his fellow homeless men that he had once been different he had once been a, a, a prominent businessman very successful before he had had his problems and sort of hit bottom now, he looked like all the others who lived on Skid Row. He uh, smelled bad. He dressed in rags. He drank heavily. But he was always bragging of better times when he was respected and even wealthy. And he had all these friends, he said, in high places. His friends uh, didn't believe a word he said. And, and they always made fun of him because of it. And they would say things like, you've always been a nobody, uh, you're a nobody, now you'll always be a nobody, that kind of thing. And uh, this, this troubled the man greatly and, and made him want to tell his story all the more. Well, one day he was telling about his old days and they were doing their normal mocking of him and so forth. And, and he happened to see out of the corner of his eye an obviously successful man walking down the street on the other side. And he turned back to his friends and he claimed to know that guy. He claimed to know this particular wealthy man from his former life. And well, that proved to be a mistake because his friends just laughed harder and, and, and asked him to prove it by talking to the man. So he was sort of caught in his own lies and... Uh, but he felt particularly desperate, and he ran across the street, and he whispered to the now frightened man, please, mister, I'm sorry to bother you. I don't want money, but please, oh, please, will you pretend to know me? Well, the wealthy man glanced back across the street at the crowd, that was there watching and realized what the situation was. He sensed that this poor man was desperate, so he, he let out a little shout and he, he clapped the man on the back. He threw his arms around him 
and shook his hand as hard as he could. And he said extra loud so those across the street would hear. He said, I haven't seen you in years. Whatever happened to you, I wondered, how are you doing? Can I do anything for you? And he took him on down the road and he cleaned him up a bit, got him a haircut and a shave and, and a good meal and bought him some nicer clothes, gave him some money. And then the, the, the rich man went on his way and uh, the drunk went back to Skid Row. And, but now he had some substance for his stories because there was someone who had refused to be ashamed of him. Now this may offend you a bit, but it is a little parable of our relationship with Jesus Christ. Think about it with me for a moment. Think about how amazing it is for Jesus to be willing to say he knows us after all we've done. Think about how Jesus refuses to be ashamed of us, although we've done shameful things. In the book of Hebrews, the writer is dealing with Christians who are being tempted to trade away real Christianity for a cheap imitation. And he is trying mightily through this series of messages which we know as the book of Hebrews under God's inspiration to prevent that from happening for, to prevent them from going back to a cheap imitation if you look at the first verse of this chapter that we read in chapter 2 verse 1 he writes therefore we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard lest we drift away from it what causes people to drift away? What causes people to, to sort of leave the true life of faith? Well, there may be a number of things. People can get hurt. Uh, they can experience failure in their personal life. They have burdens that they're struggling with, that they're finding difficult to bear, and they feel defeated. I think most times people don't consciously set out to drift away from God, to, to leave their faith. They don't plan to backslide or to become lukewarm in their faith. But they lose their spiritual strength, their, their spiritual confidence. They get discouraged. Temptation comes at them sort of in waves and, and wears them out. And this is what we see all around us at times uh, in people. And, and this is what the writer of Hebrews is trying to address. See, when we struggle spiritually, when we hurt, when we're down, that's when we need to pay greater attention to God and especially to his son, Jesus. Why? Because Jesus has been there. He has already seen and experienced these kinds of struggles. In fact, he blazed a trail through those things as an example for us. If you look a little bit later in this same chapter, verse 18, notice what it says there. Of Jesus, it says, For because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. He knows what it's like to, to face the temptations and the struggles of this life. He blazed a trail through those things. He can help us because he's been through it. And, and so he is sort of that wonderful older brother who went before us and, um, and sort of showed us the way. And we often say that the, the church is a family and here really is the proof of that. Here is what it's really supposed to mean when we think of the church as family. Look at, look at our text, verses 10 through 13. 
few things that are emphasized here uh, along these lines. The first being that, that Jesus never asked us to do anything that he didn't do himself. Verse 10. Now, one of the, the sources of fights in, in families among siblings is, is when, when one of them perceives that the other is getting away with something. We, we know what that's like. In, in our house, um, in previous times, it was usually when our oldest uh, was asked to clean up the mess that she felt one of the other two had made. That seemed to happen quite a bit. But I guess that's just part of being the oldest, if you think about it. Jesus' entire purpose, his entire ministry, was devoted to cleaning up other people's messes, to, um, to fix other people's mistakes. In fact, his greatest work, which of course was securing our salvation by his death on the cross, amounted to cleaning up a mess of sin that we had made, right? This is what he is about. And so when we struggle in life, when, when we're picked on, when we're unfairly treated, when we're put down, when we're discouraged, we need to remember that Jesus has already been there. He has already done that. He went first. He blazed the trail. He was the pioneer of sufferings. Secondly, in the text... Notice that Jesus is not ashamed to recognize us as his siblings. That's in verse 11. This is even more amazing to me. You see, our older brother was perfect. He was sinless. Now, no older brothers, uh, me included, in this world are like that. We all have our flaws, but not, not our older brother Jesus. He was sinless, and, and, and no one here, I'm confident, wants to put themselves on that level because we realize that, that we mess up all the time, we sin, we embarrass ourselves, we embarrass our Father in heaven by the things that we do at times. But Jesus is not ashamed to be called our brother. We are siblings, verse 11 says, because we have the same Father. God the Father. But Jesus, despite our flaws, is not ashamed to be our brother. In fact, elsewhere in Scripture, he is described as our advocate or our attorney before God. He is the one before God who makes the case for us. He is the one who will speak up for us in the judgment. Do you know anybody that you would rather make your case before God? Can you think of anybody? I don't. I will be perfectly happy on that last day when I stand before God to shut my own mouth and to let the sinless Son of God speak for me. That's what we want to have happen on that day. How's that possible? Well, it's called grace. It is called amazing love. It's called being in Christ. This is the essence of, of what Christian means. Now, there are people that Jesus is ashamed of. And, and will be ashamed of in the judgment. If you look at um, a passage like Mark chapter 8, verse 38, Jesus says there, he says, those who are ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will be also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of the Father with the holy angels. So there are people who he will be ashamed of. There is a limit to the size of God's family. 
Now that limit is set by the people who are ashamed of him. Okay? But there are those that Jesus will not recognize as brothers and sisters. But of his true siblings, he is never ashamed. Despite our imperfections. Despite our mess. He is not ashamed to be called our brother. And the last thing in this, in this passage, the writer turns to the old scriptures to make the point that Jesus is not in any way aloof from us, his siblings, even though we are in all ways below him. This is verse 12 and verse 13 of the text. Another thing, you know, that could cause stress and tension in a physical family would be if one member began to think and act like they were so much better than everyone else um, and, and wouldn't have to, anything to do with them. You might remember an Old Testament story, Joseph and his brothers, that was a source of tension in that family uh, when his brothers perceived Joseph thought he was better than all of them. And that, that kind of thing can happen. Jesus is not that way. Despite having every reason to be. You see. Because he truly is exalted and above all of us. He's not like that. Instead, this passage describes Jesus as standing right in the middle of us. Notice the wording. Right in the midst of our congregation, right in the middle of our assembly, and even proclaiming God's name. Uh, it describes him as one who, who has to trust God at times, just like we have to, you see. And it describes him as one who is just willing to associate with us, to be with us. Now, this life we've been called... To live the Christian life is not always easy. In fact, at times it can be the hardest life on this earth. And if you're here considering the Christian life, um, we don't want to make it sound like it's always easy. It most certainly is not. It is a great challenge to live for Jesus in this world. We struggle. And when, when we struggle, we really need to remember passages like this. Uh, we need to remember that Jesus has already been through it. There's been somebody who's been through this and, and made it through. And, and we need to remember that the perfect Son of God, the sinless Son of God, is not ashamed of us despite our weakness. Now, we may be ashamed of ourselves, but he's not ashamed of us. If we are in him. Despite our weakness. And we need to remember. His promise. To be right here with us. Every step of the way. Behold I am with you always. Even to the end of the age. He said. See Jesus. Ran the race before us. He finished way ahead of us. And now he comes back to us. To cheer us along the way. Until we finish. And, in fact, he will speak for us on our behalf. We won't go before God, hauling all our accomplishments and our works and our deeds. Don't think you have to pile those things up to impress God. It's not going to work. We will go before God alongside of our older brother, Jesus the Christ. And he will speak for us. And he will say, Father, I know this person. This is my brother. This is my sister. Welcome them home. And that's all it takes. I want us to remember just a few other words from this great writer of the letter to the Hebrews. They come from chapter 10. We'll close with them this morning. 
He wrote, therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way he opened for us, through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more, as you see the day drawing near. Isn't it great to have an older brother? I hope he truly is yours this morning. The lesson is yours this morning. The invitation is extended to any who need to come to submit to, to the Lord, to obey his word, to, to ask for prayers of strength and encouragement this morning in this assembly. If we can serve you in one of those ways we want to this morning before we go, and we give you this opportunity to think about it and to, to come let us know about it while we stand, while we sing this song.